when you have such lovely eyes. The guy has no fucking eyes! What? <laughs> Hey internet, it's Jessica, and welcome back to Cinderella Phenomenon, Rumpel's Root. So in the last episode, we did discover a little bit about Rumpel's past, and we did find out he was a doctor. Um, someone from his past showed up and, and tr essentially triggered some memories for him, and Rumpel thinks that if the memories are triggered, maybe they will appear in his journal, which he needs to have three entries full in order to get his memory back. And unfortunately, no one can remember his name either, this part of his course, which really sucks. So hopefully we can see what's in Rumpel's journal. We give Perfect the medicines we purchased in town as soon as we arrive back to the Martian. Then Rumpel proudly announced that he is a doctor to anyone that will listen to him. Of course he would. Everyone seemed happy for him, save for the Martian pardons that did find Rumpel annoying, who were mostly men. Afterwards, Rumpel asks Anise if he might be able to take over the medic medications for Perfet, if only because Anise is bu busier than him. Rumpel hasn't been at the Martian long, and yet he's already found something to help break his curse. And then there's me. I don't think anyone will be able to help me. At the end of the night, when I finally make have time to myself, I will return to my room and rest. The next day, I am set right back to my chores. Rumpel is nowhere to be seen in the morning, and Anise says it is because he is tending to Perfet. He appears later in the afternoon, still full of smiles and still flattery as he goes back to serving. How does he have so much energy? At the end of the day, I plop down on the settee to rest. My legs are weak from all the walking I have done today, and I can still feel the tiredness from my arms from sweeping with Mr. Broom. Princess? I notice Denise is standing beneath the doorway, smiling at me uncertainly. Thank you for your work today. Why is she thanking me for the work I obviously did not want to do? It's not as if I asked to do any of this. But you still helped. Anise nervously shipped on her feet. So, um, I just wanted to say thanks. When I did not make any effort to continue speaking with her, Anise gives a nervous little nod before heading back towards her room. She's trying to be nice, but of course, Lucet is still not, you know, nice enough yet. Long after we had, long after her departure, I heard an exuberant and familiar voice. I should count my lucky stars, for they are giving me a rare opportunity to meet with my lovely princess late at night. I should have gone to my room. <laughs> Rumpel stops before me, winking. The moonlight on your face makes your beautiful eyes sparkle like the most precious gold, princess. I'm not in the mood for your flattery. But princess, flattery is just a, co a, compil a compilation of compliments. Everyone loves compliments. That's not true. Even in the real world, I don't like it when random people start complimenting me. Like, thank you for being nice. But if you try to get even creepier with it, it's just like, back off. Do not care for your compliments. Or Lady Anise thanks, either? He heard that? You should learn to let people spoil you. I stare at him. This is the last thing I have ever expected anyone to say. My whole life I have been called spoiled and rotten, the Ice Princess. Even the Lord and Perfect want me to do good deeds because they think I am incapable of goodness. I clutch my fists and continue to stare at him, not understanding the swell of emotion inside of me. Why is he being so nice to me? Your first lesson is learning how to let people spoil you. He draws back his hand, reaching into his pocket to present me with a small yellow bag. What's this? For you, my sweet princess. Okay, he likes it when- once again, he likes it when Lucette is mean, but I don't know if, like, you know, I'm supposed to accept this or not. Hang on, let me save. Let me try no first. Cannot accept your gift. But princess, my advice, you have no reason to spoil me. Princess, this is what I've been trying to explain to you all day. You don't need a reason to spoil someone. It doesn't always have to be about paying someone back. Rumpel smiles, a little sheepishly. Then he places the bag back in my hand and curls my fingers around it. You deserve nice things, princess. You barely know me, and yet you still say that? Barely know you? We may not know each other personally, but that doesn't mean I don't know enough about you. I am giving you this gift because I truly want you to have it. Besides, this is both a thank you and an apology gift. A thank you for accepting me as your partner, and an apology for my behavior yesterday. I don't remember what I did, but both you and I- but both you and the boy seem frightened. Aw, oh, that's nice of him. I know, I know, I know Rumpel comes on a little bit strong, but he's like genuinely nice. I look down at the little bag. I open it up inside where a little white chocolate piece fashioned into- Oh my nose! I opened it up, and inside it is a little white chocolate piece fashioned into the shape of a flower. A lily. It's not much, but you are absolutely must accept it, princess. Otherwise, my guild would drown me in the dark shadows of sorrow for the rest of time. <laughs> He's so dramatic. Lilies are my favorite flower. 
They say you give a white lily to someone you enjoy spending time with. Oh, in floor language, that also stands for purity and majesty. He winks at me. Perfect for you, princess. Why? Why what? Why would you give this to me? No matter what you say about doing nice things for people, I don't see how that applies to me. And why would you thank me for being your partner? I did not even want to be your partner at first. But you do now? She does. I am unable to withhold my surprise. Rumple raises an eyebrow, then sighs. Princess, you don't trust compliments, do you? Mother always told me that people were two-sided, that they would do anything to make you believe that you were a friend. No. Never fear, my sweet princess. I'll make sure I'll make sure I compliment you until you learn to accept them. But no buts! I've deprived my happiness from making ladies like yourself happy. The compliments may seem strange to you, but don't worry, you'll see in time. See what? The connections between people. You assume that I'm just a flirt. But I get to know an awful lot about people. It's the reason I can guess so much about you. Ah, uh, you know, Rumble has a point too. You can't just assume people just because of the way they act around you if, you if you don't know them very well. So I'm pretty sure this is what I think. It's kind of like the way that um, Emmeline was like, uh, she's very happy all the time, but on the inside, she's a really sad person. I feel like Rumble is like that too. He uses the flirting thing as a defense mechanism. What could Rumble possibly know about me? So, what do you think? Are you more attracted to me now because of my mysterious aura or my doctor <laughs> doctorly sophistication? He leans closer to me, his eyes sparkling. I gave it your own personal <laughs> doctor! Rumble, no! I will slap you if you touch me again. Rumble pulls back and raises both of his hands in surrender, but the smile does not leave his face. You really are hopeless, aren't you? Do you think- do you think so? I thought the events from today might have proven otherwise. Oh, speaking of which, I read over my journal earlier. His expression has become oddly solemn. Shall I enlighten you? Why would you tell me of this? Oh, you're not interested? I thought you might be, since I was your partner. If I don't listen, you'll tell me regardless, so feel free to share. Rumpel sighs and flips his journal open. Unfortunately, it wasn't much. The memory began to come together again as I was reading it. A lot of it still doesn't make any sense. I glanced down at the entry he has stopped at. Look at the bottom page, princess. I follow his gaze to the bottom of the page and pause, noticing a gap. There's no signature. All I, I, and I always sign the end of my journal entries, I write. I wonder if it might be the final piece of the puzzle. The final piece of your curse? If my name refuses to show up in the book, it may be very well a final memory I, I need to regret. I think that's why, yeah. I'm pretty sure that's why his name's showing up there, because he has to figure out everything else first. You believe that the signature will give you what your true name then? I have a feeling that might be the case. It was the first thing I noticed when I when the in entry appeared. That would explain why the boy in town didn't know my name either. And there's something else. Something else that's missing? The journal entry is cryptic at best. Vague. Almost like an incomplete puzzle piece. I stare at him, not understanding. Slowly, Rumpel begins to explain. It says here that the boy's family rushed into the clinic. He had terminal illness that I could not cure. He was at death's door and I couldn't save him. But he's still alive, isn't he? He even said that you saved him. Yes, there's a re resolution in the journal, but it's not very helpful. I glance out of the journal entry as Rumpel continues to speak. I refuse to give up. I know that there had to be a way to save the boy. I never gave up on patience. The journal entry, I describe someone who came to help me after I saved the boy. He lifts the book and points to the words, reading them aloud. I met her for the first time tonight. She told me that she had some way to help the boy, so we struck a deal. I hope I did not come to regret this. Oh! Maybe, maybe, maybe he made a deal with a witch to save the boy. Oh my god, Rumpel, what? That's so nice of him, though, if he did that. He snaps the journal shut, startling me. He sighs and runs his hand through his hair. That's it. Someone helped me somehow and made a deal. I'm assuming this is related to my curse, but I can't say how. Why did you write so vaguely? I wish I could ask my past self the same question. So in the end, you're still not sure when you were cursed. Rumpel pauses, then shakes his head. I believe it started here. Not the curse, but the events that led to it. There's a reason that this first memory is being triggered. It's important. The, for the first few moments, the two of us are quiet. Rumpel's curse is a mystery, not because of he's hiding it, like karma is, but because he doesn't understand it himself. After a few moments, Rumpel begins to laugh, breaking the silence, and I look at him, startled. What's so funny? Oh, it's so funny, it's just... This is very. This is all very mysterious, isn't it? And my mysterious past makes me more alluring, doesn't it? Only Rumble could take a serious moment and change into this. 
Well, what do you think, princess? Are you drawn into the mystery of it? <laughs> I have no choice. You tell me if I didn't want to know. Oh, but I- but you do! I can see the curiosity in your loving golden eyes. And I could see it earlier today, too. Thank you for accompanying me into town. I want to believe that I only met the boy because you were there to guide me my way. We're, we were looking for medical supplies. That boy appeared through mere coincidence. No, it was more than mere coincidence. It was destiny! Fine, whatever you say. Listening to him- listening to him is exhausting. It makes me realize how tired I am. All these revelations are making my head spin. I'm going to bed now. I'm too tired for this. Uh. It is indeed a busy day. We will continue to enlighten this discussion some other time. Perhaps. I turn and walk away a little- with the little chocolates in my hand. As I walk back to the door, the darkness of the hallway, Rumpelstoff's voice echoes behind me. Sweet dreams, my princess. I think- I think Rumpel is really a nice dude. Like, I really think that he sacrificed himself, in, essentially, to get cursed in order to save the boy. You waited, but the children didn't come, did they? They promised that we'd be back today! We even crossed pinkies! Promises are futile, dearest heart. But... I told you before and I will tell you again, people are selfish creatures. They will always put their own well-being before others. No one does anything selflessly. To put your own trust in someone is a weakness, you said. Even those that make promise will only keep them in benefits of them. And you, my sweet, were obviously not beneficial to those children. So they didn't like playing with me? No, they didn't. Come here, darling. You don't need those children. The two of us can play together, as we always do. I can always trust you, mother? Of course, my love. God damn it. <laughs> Poor Lucette. My head feels foggy. Maybe it was because it took me forever to fall asleep yesterday. And then, to make things work, I ended up having that dream. Mother, you're the only one I can trust, right? I slowly slide on my bed and make my way to the dresser. The little bag that's where I left it last night. I open it up and let a little white chocolate leaf fall into my hand. It's cute! Is he really trying to help me? I remember his face yesterday and his bright smile as he, pre he presented this to me. So, so I slowly run my fingers across the delicate white petals. He couldn't have known white lilies were my favorite flower. There's no reason to be sentimental about something like this. It's just silly. I'm about to put the flower back in the bag, but I stop, eyeing it once more. Slowly, I bring it to my lips and bite up a small petal. It's actually pretty good. I stuff the little flower back into the bag and make my way downstairs. The Martian is not busy early in the morning, but everyone is starting on their own chores. At least, I assume this much when I see Anise and then Walt, who is help bringing her things. Then I hear rising voices and then I realize it's not calm. At least I don't pretend to be something I'm not. Oh god, he's fighting with karma. You say you're pretending when you go around flirting with all the female pardons that day, in and out? You can't seriously mean all the devil you spout. Karma and Rumble are stand off opposite sides of the table, staring at each other down. A teacup filled with what looks to be cool tea sits this close to the Karma, abandoned. Flirting with a lady is not a crime. One day, your flirting is gonna get to you and into even more trouble than it already has. I never had a lady say that I mistreated her, not once. Oh? I'm sure many could attest to that being more than slightly annoyed. You're just jealous that I can speak to the ladies without a disguise, aren't you? Ooh. Karma slams his head down on the table, shaking it. Oh, this is when- Oh, this is right! This is during Karma's route, when he was getting angry because of his curse? Yeah. The tavern grows quiet. quiet. Waltz looks over, his eyebrows furred with worry. If you so much as to make one more comment about my curse, then stop making comments about how I speak. The two of them glare at each other. It almost looks as if Karma maybe might circle the table and slap him, but the fight freezes as Jurin strides up to the two men. It's too early for the two of you to be already at each other's throats. But he started it! All I did was make a comment. He was the one that picked a fight. There you go again, twisting words! Jurin stops on the ground. The two men once again turn to look at her. It's my job to break up unnecessary fights and I will do it! If you two continue fighting, go do it somewhere else, like the forest, where you can't disturb anyone. Both men turn away at each other, obviously agitated. Rumble's expression is cloudy and makes his way over to the bar to begin helping set the tables. Jura notices me watching. She waves at you with a tear with a tear smile on her face. Sorry I had to wake up to that, princess. I shrug and make my way over to Mr. Broom. It's like waking up to two children arguing. Agreed wholeheartedly. Jura sighs before looking at me thoughtfully. 
Maybe you could have a word with Rumpel later. I have no idea how their argument even started, but maybe you can get up to the bottom of this. I'm not a babysitter. But I'd heard the two of you were partners? Anyway, hopefully this doesn't happen again. Good luck with your work today, princess. Jiren walks up, vigilant as always, and you notice Garland looked at her from the bar. A slight frown on his face. I started walking around the tavern, starting with the first cleaning and then with the stacking. Delora makes her strides remarks that she's at my slowness as work, and I try my best to ignore her while occasionally throwing her insults back at her. It's if as she has nothing better to do. The door opens to the tavern and Parfait steps inside with a bright smile. She looks more energetic than usual. I wonder if this is because of Rumpel's medicine suggestions. Later, I manage to catch Rumpel when the two of us are both on break. He looks pleased to see me until I mention Karma. Why were you two fighting earlier? What a sad day it is that the princess is talking about another man to my face. Just answer me. I was getting ready for the events of today, as always, speaking to the lovely women who filter in and out of this place. When the beast appeared behind me, how ironic he calls him the beast. <laughs> Even his insults are dramatic. Your flirting is distracting me, he proclaimed. Well, your flirting is annoying. But all I'm doing is complimenting women. I'm not impeding anyone's work. I thought that oh, I thought that was the only reason he was calling me out on such thing was because he was actually jealous. You should have seen a scowl. And here we go. So I politely told him to mind his business, but he was relentless. And when I continued to, and when he continued to insult my demeanor, well, I had to say something back. But I wasn't the one to start the fight. I swear that both of them really sound like children. No doubt Karma would be blaming Rumple. Princess, you don't really think I'm really confrontational, do you? I think Karma is far more confrontational, but it does not help that Rumple always snaps back at him. The two of you are both at fault. But Princess! In the end, you were having a childish argument. I think that Rumple might try to protest again, and I'm surprised when he shrugs his shoulders and sighs. Yes, it was childish. Because that man is a child, oh god. <laughs> I roll my eyes. Ah, your irritated scowl chills my heart, Princess. I feel a tinge of excitement. I'm leaving now. There's no really point in having this conversation. It is a problem between Karma and Rumple. They aren't children. They can figure this out on their own. Oh, my princess of my heart. Why must you depart so early? I ignore Rumple and I leave him standing there as I return to my ship a little earlier. Honestly, I would much rather focus on work than Rumple. He can just be as tiring, if not more. Though, after what happened last night, I do not think he is terrible as I thought. He's not! Once again, I think he's just doing the whole flooring thing as a defense mechanism. The day goes on and Rumple and I speak on briefly during breaks. Every day, I eat another piece of the lily until one of them remains. One afternoon, just before my break, Rumple approaches me with a mischievous smile on his face. My lovely princess, how are you today? What do you want? Your cold shoulder is enticing. I have one more table to serve, do not bother me. But princess, I've decided I know exactly how to teach you to be good. All of your other lessons have been useless so far. But please just trust me. To put my trust in someone is weakness. I'm going to teach you how to flirt. Oh my god, no! <laughs> what? The first step to flirting is eye contact, princess. Wait, but why are you- Rumble points out a customer, a young man sitting right beside the window. The second is to smile. Smile, princess, because I'm sure you even look more stunning when you do. Then you start a conversation with him. Body language is important. There are certain signals that key men into the fact that women are interested in them. I think playing with your hair is one, a gentle tap on the shoulder is another. I should have expected Rumble to spout out this, so this sort of nonsense. Um, princess, the customer has been waiting for a while now. Is something wrong? I noticed the customer looking at me expectantly. He is some man, a usual customer I, I often see. Oh, and princess, don't forget the compliments. Make them as delicate and illustrative as you can. I move far away from Rumble before he can mutter, muddle my thoughts any further. Already my feet feel like lead. I feel myself staring at the man for far too long. The way he stares back at me, his expression is so unreadable. Suddenly it makes me feel more uncomfortable. Do I really have to do what Rumble says? I stop in front of the man and set down the tray, eyes on his. I do not have to follow Rumble's advice, but for some reason my lips quirk. The smile on my lips though lasts only a half a second. Are you okay? <laughs> Oh no! I don't think this is gonna work out well if, if Lucia tries to flirt. Let's try to flirt. I can feel Rumble smiling at my back. If this was for anyone else but him, I would think it was some kind of prick. But considering the way Rumble acts all the time, maybe he's really trying to help me. 
I tried to recall how he flirted at the customers before. Could not help but notice you were alone, sir. I'm always alone. My heart is thumping far too loudly in my chest. What kind of things does Rumble usually say? Madam, you are the most beautiful thief that I have ever met. For you it is who has stolen my heart and stolen my gaze. Your eyes are more captivating than the stars, my sweet. If I could, I would stare in them forever and lose myself in their majesty. <laughs> Oh my god, you remind me of a rose with thorns, but the thorns are what makes the rose so alluring. All he does is spell complimentary gibberish. I will try to do the same. How is it that you would always be alone when you have such lovely eyes? The guy has no fucking eyes! What? <laughs> the customer stares at me baffled. I force myself to continue. Your eyes remind me of leaves in fall as they flutter beneath the bright gaze of the sun and... I stop. The words nothing more than shallow lie make me feel strangely hollow. <laughs> the guy's like, what the fuck is wrong with this girl? The man is just staring at me, but he looks uncomfortable. Still, I do not think he is anywhere near uncomfortable as I am. Ma'am? Perhaps you would- My voice trails off. I bite my lip, so hard that I can taste something metallic. The man's expression is a mixture of awe and perplexity. I merely turn away and walk off. My whole face is hot, and I can feel anger brewing deep down inside of me. Ah, oh, princess! Leave me alone! Princess, we're not done! I do not care. I ignore everyone's gaze as I make my way back quickly as I possibly can up the stairs to my room. There, I collapse onto the bed and lay with my arms outstretched. That was really funny, though. <laughs> Why would I ever even thought of making taking Rumple's advice? Hours go by, and eventually I realize that it is time for me to help Anise with the night chores. Now I'm helping her restock some bottles and Watson and Karma brought back from town. I hope Anise does not mention what happened earlier today. I slip out of bed and head down to the main area of the tavern. The room is almost quiet by the time I go downstairs. Parfait and Delora are talking to each other at the table. Karma passes me by as I walk down the stairs. He looks exhausted and oddly frustrated. Cause he's- he's night guarding- night guard duty and then he's like, the beast is coming out. I make my way to Anise who's already putting the bottles on the shelves. Oh, princess, are you okay now? I'm fine. Now, what did you need me to do? Anise explains how restocking works. She shows me the labels on the shelves and explains how the empty spots and where the new bottles go. It's not a hard job and I can e and one can easily do without thinking too hard. For a while, the only sounds that can be heard in the Martians are bottles clinging against each other. Underneath that are murmuring between Parfait and Delora. I have no idea what they're talking about, but they look serious on- so I must be important. Um, so, Princess? Can I ask what life was like in the palace? Right. She cannot remember working in the palace before. I don't mean to pry, I was just trying to make conversation. I would rather not. Oh, okay. Eventually, Parfait and Dolores stand to their seats and move to another room and continue their conversation. Anise breaks the silence again. The tavern is so nice when it's quiet like this, isn't it? You can hear the sounds outside if you open the window. My hands move swiftly, placing the bottles on the shelves with labels. All I want to do is get the work done and return to my room. It was like this in the old place I used to work. I was hired by a rich family to be their maid. Their mansion was so beautiful. You could hear the crickets if you were by the window at the bottom of the floor. It seems like her memory has been twisted by my curse. She cannot remember by working at the palace. All she remembers is working for a rich family. It was such a nice place, princess. There was a girl close to my age that had a radiant smile. Radiant smile. She must be talking about Emmeline. The head of the mansion is ki a really kind man, and... She suddenly goes quiet, and look of confusion con coming on her face. She pauses and then shakes her head. I can't seem to remember everyone that was there, but I'm pretty sure they were all good people. At least I like to think so. I was just a bad maid. She was. Because of her, Dolores' dress was torn. I... I was too ashamed to tell any of the mistresses that I have couldn't save... That I couldn't save her doll. Save her doll? Anise looks down, a smile wistful. I was fired on my first day because I couldn't save one of the mistresses' dolls. I was the one that was cleaning her shelves that day. And when I went in, I saw a crow that had come in through the window and was pecking at one of the dolls. I shoot it away, but it was too late. The doll had a little rip in its dress, and I was fired for not doing my job properly. Oh no, so it wasn't her fault she didn't really do anything! So it wasn't Anise who ripped Dolores' dress, but a bird? Is this why Dolores insisted Anise deserved an apology? What happened after you were fired? Lady Parfit found me on the streets. I couldn't go back to my aunt's house, not after what happened. She... 
never liked me anyway. Anissa's face clouds briefly with a sorrow but expression in short-lived. Can never forget the day I met Lady Parfait. I told her that I would be able to help and anyone who that got sick. That and I can even do cooking since I've been a since I've been making meals for my father since I was a young girl. I begged for her to take me in, and she did. I owe Lady Parfait a lot. Why didn't you go back to your father after you were fired? My father passed away a long a while ago. My mother died giving birth to me. My father was so was a herbalist. He taught me a lot while he was still with me. So before Rumble came in, I helped Lady Perfect with the herbal remedies. So you have no one. That's what I thought. But now I have everyone here. The Martian is a family now. Family. Princess, we're all happy to have you here too. You really help out around the Martian, and I can tell Rumble is happy to have you as his partner. The memories of what happened today slowly seeps back into my mind. Gonna help with the irritation bubble inside of me. I know he's a little overwhelming, but I'm pretty sure Rumble's really trying to help you, just like he's trying to help Lady Parfait. It's not the same thing at all. The two of us continue working until Anissa makes another wistful comment. The place I worked before this. It feels like there was some warmth in the gigantic comb, but it was stifled. That place isn't warm at all. I speak the words without even meaning to. Anissa looks up at me curiously. The king suddenly start, started speaking to me when mother died, but it was never enough. Before he was a cold, before he was cold and distant, and even now he favors his new wife and children over me. There were people, but they all wore fake smiles, and my father, he was the worst of them all. I may as well never existed to him. Princess, I'm sorry. For what? You're talking about the palace, right? The king always seems so nice. He put his kingdom before his children, and he fidgets nervously. I'm sorry. Apologies are not what changed the past. Sometimes apologizing seems like what we can do when we can't change something that has already happened. I think about Anise, who tried to save my doll, and the way I fired her that day. Rumble to once told me that all I had to do was listen to people to sympathize with them. Could that also be true for finding out the truth? All I can do for make up for what I did is... Rem okay, so remain silent? Is that the advice that Rumple was like saying? Just listen to people? It is not her fault that the doll was in the shape it was. I fired her permanently, even if she didn't give me the entire story. But she could be lying to me. She says she did not bring it up before because she was ashamed, but it was far more likely that she was making excuses for her incompetence. But then, what reasons would she have for not for telling me that now? My heart plummets into the pit of my stomach, and suddenly I feel dizzy and irritated. Anissa's eyes are suddenly downcast, and no matter the attempt, her smile isn't bright as it once was. I quickly finish stacking the bottles on the shelf. I'm done. Anissa starts to look at me with an unusual tired expression on her face. Thank you for listening to me, princess, and for telling me a little bit about yourself, too. I feel like I might have said too much. Do not respond to Anise, but instead choose to head to the front door. Anise asks where I'm going, but I just ignore her. I think about heading into town, but then reconsider. I decide to head into the forest instead. Okay, so I'm gonna end the episode there. I hope you guys enjoyed Cinderella Phenomenon. We did learn a little bit more about Rumple. I'm pretty sure he's just a nice guy underneath. He's just doing this whole flirting thing so people don't, like, you know, get too close to it. It was kind of like how Karma does it, too, where he's very charming, just so that people don't really know who he is underneath, you know what I mean? Um... But yeah, I, I'm not too sure about that last choice, though, with, with uh, Anise and all that. But we'll, we'll see what happens. Anyway, if you guys enjoyed Cinderella Phenomenon, remember to leave a like, comment, and subscribe to join the companions. And if you would like to support the channel on Patreon, there's a link in the description where you can do that. Get early access to videos, videos for Patreon only, a Discord server to come talk to me, and a bunch of other cool stuff. Or if you would prefer to support me through my store, that's another way. Alright! Well... This is- this is new. I like that we're getting to know about Anise as well, because she was just fired and we ne never knew, like, the real reason as to it. But it's good that we get to learn about the side characters as well. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye! Oh my god! No! They killed her! Iris. Slick when it's between my fingers. <laughs> oh, that's so awkward! I'm glad you're enjoying yourself too. She gauges my awkward expression in cool.